Hello, everybody. This is Ian McVeigh, Manager of, Manager of, of Sustainability with Durham Region. Uh, thank you all for joining us on this uh, webinar today, uh, where, where we'll be uh, talking about home flood pre pre preparedness. Um, uh, we're just going to wait a minute or two to let a few, uh, few extra people filter in uh, before we get started. So feel free to get yourself a glass of water or whatever beverage of your choice. And, uh, and we'll be we'll be starting in a moment. All right, Kate, should we uh, get started? Do you want to move move over to, to, to the next slide? All right, hello everybody. Welcome to the webinar. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, so just a reminder, we're here today to, uh, to talk about home flood pre pre preparedness. Uh, my name is Ian McVeigh. You see a picture of me there. My Hair looks nowhere near as nice as it does there, given that I haven't had a haircut in three months, as I'm sure many of you <laughs> do as well. Um, but uh, I'm uh, I'm the uh, manager of, of sustainability with Durham Region. I, I work in the office of the regional chair and, and CAO, and I see that um, uh, John Henry, Ch Ch Chair John Henry, is there. So hi, John. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm joined with by Kate Potter, who is really the the key force behind this webinar. She helped to bring bring all of this together. So thanks, Kate. She's working uh, b behind the scenes to make sure all this runs smoothly. Um, so this home flood pr protection webinar is really coming out of our uh, the Durham Community Climate a a Adaptation Plan, um, which really kind of sets the stage for a br broad framework for how the region. Uh, local municipalities, conservation authorities, energy utilities, and other stakeholders are going to work together to um, to help help build resilience uh, in, 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 in in communities across the region. Uh, so really happy to be here today to be sharing some of the wealth of knowledge that we have around uh, home flood pr pr protection. Um, so you know implementation of this plan as well as our other uh, climate change plans in the region have taken a, a greater urgency um, following regional council's declaration of a climate emergency in January 2020. At the time, the region and local area municipalities, including Pickering, Ajax, Whitby, Oshawa, and Clarington, you know, have joined the more than 400 Canadian municipalities that have uh, d d declared a climate emergency. Now it seems a bit, maybe a bit strange in the current context where we're dealing with a, you know, a very acute near-term emergency in, 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 the, in the form of uh, COVID-19. Um, but, but you know, we, we, we understand that over the longer term, climate change remains a, a cr cr critical issue for us to deal with uh, in, in Durham region. Um, now, before moving further along, I wanted to get a, a sense of the group or the, the participants that have joined us. So we got a little poll to get uh, a sense of uh, where people are joining us from in Durham Region. Um, so if you could, uh, you should see a, a poll have popped up on your screen. If you could just pick um, where where you where you're joining us from, that would be that would be great. We should be able to see the results live in a moment. Maybe Kate. Once we have uh, 20 or 30 responses, we can put it up. Oh, there we go. Right. So yeah, good uh, good distribution across the region. 
that's great. Um, so let's go back to the slides. Um, so before we go further, just a few uh, housekeeping items. Um, so currently all, all attendees are muted. Um, that's to manage any dogs or kids that might be running around in the background. Um, so we do want um, some interactivity. So if you do have questions, please enter them into the chat box that you should see on the uh, GoToWebinar application. Uh, Kate and I will be uh, facilitating a, a, a Q&A period at the end of the webinar. Uh, just a note that this webinar is currently being live streamed by R R Rogers TV. So we want to thank Rogers for helping to, to spread the word about this uh, this important topic beyond those that are able to join uh, here on the uh, uh, on the w w webinar platform. We're also recording the webinar uh, and and we'll be posting it on the region's websites for uh, for those that were that were unable to join us. Um, after the webinar, we're going to be sending out a, a uh, evaluation survey where we're going to hope to get some feedback from you around your experience in the webinar as well as any uh, future topics that you might want to uh, to uh, have have featured in in this in this format. As well, we'll be sharing a list of resources that were uh, referred to in the uh, in the uh, presentations that follow. So overall, the, the, the webinar is, is 90 minutes. So we have 60 minutes of presentations and approximately 30 for uh, Q&A. So we, we, we hope you, you can stick around for that portion and engage with the panelists in, in, that, in that format. So overall objectives of the webinar are one, to provide an update on, on climate change trends for Dur Durham region, uh, including the increasing flood risk p p potential that we're seeing. Secondly, to learn to begin to learn how to prepare your home and family for for any emergency, uh, and in particular of a flood a flood type uh, emergency, to learn more about roles and responsibilities for flood risk management between municipal government, uh, conservation authorities, and 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 other stakeholders. It, it is a bit of a complex realm, uh, and so you'll through through this webinar you help to learn about who who plays what what role in that in that. Uh, in, 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 this, uh, in this topic. And then finally, you'll be learning about some, some simple and cost-effective things that you can do in your own home and on your own pr property, both to uh, pr prepare yourself for a flood as well as, as well as during a flood to make sure that you're, you're uh, limiting any, uh, any d damage that, that, m that might occur. So just wanted to start off with a bit of a view into Durham Region's future climate as we understand it. So uh, last year, um, Durham Region commissioned uh, a, an update to our future climate pro projections. We worked with experts uh, at the Toronto Region Con Conservation Authority as well as uh, University of Toronto to, to update the, the, the modeling that we've done. And it's really a, a best in class uh, future climate model that, that we've uh, d developed. Um, I'm not going to go into all the details of these of these various data points, but there's some there's some kind of key messages that I want to put forward. One is that you know our our our, da our data tells us that the future is going to going to continue to get warmer. So days like today uh, and even hotter are, are going to become more uh, more frequent in the in the uh, d d decades to come. Uh, combined with that, we're going to see a decrease in in sort of extreme cold days, which you can see there. And then finally, and, and most importantly for, 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 for this webinar, when it comes to uh, precipitation, rain and snow, um, we're seeing a, an average overall increase per year, per year of about uh, 20%, um, as well as a, a, more, a more marked increase in, in sort of extreme events. So like the maximum events that, or the maximum rainfall that we see in a, in a, day, in a day period or in, a, in an hour long period, we're, 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 we're projecting those to increase quite uh, significantly, which of course then uh, creates risks for municipal infrastructure and 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 built infrastructure, including homes and buildings. So that's really the overall context for you know why we're looking at climate change as as a, as an emergency and why we're looking at climate uh, um, uh, resilience and uh, uh, adaptation in the in the built environment. So what are we doing to, to prepare? I mean, the answer is there's a lot going on across, you know, within the region, with our local area municipal partners, um, uh, 
uh, conservation authorities and others. This is what you see here is really just a, a snapshot in terms of what I can fit into into a slide here. So we've, we're, we're implementing new programs to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, um, which, which you know, if done in concert with uh, communities across Canada and, and indeed across the world, will help you know ensure we're kind of flattening the curve of uh, green, greenhouse gas emissions and ensuring we're not hitting some of those sort of worst case scenarios. So the key programs that we're looking at uh, at, at the region, at least right now, is um, um, residential energy retrofit pr program that we're uh, in the midst of d d developing uh, with a hoped for launch in, in uh, uh, 2021. Uh, we're looking at electric vehicles in, in, in our Durham region tr transit fleet. So we're, we're piloting uh, electric buses, uh, working with, with uh, local area municipalities. We're building a network of uh, electric vehicle charging stations across the region over the next uh, 18 months or so. We're ramping up our, our tree planting programs, including backyard, backyard uh, tree, tree planting programs as well. So that's on more of the, the greenhouse gas reduction or climate mitigation side on the, on the, on the resilience and adaptation side. We're looking at uh, municipal infrastructure systems really across all of the main uh, types of infrastructure that uh, uh, municipalities provide, including tr transportation, looking at roads, uh, bridges, culverts, looking at our water wastewater systems, and with our uh, local area municipal partners, it, it, uh, in particular, looking at uh, uh, stormwater management and uh, low impact de development. Um, but we also need to work with homeowners and ensure that that homeowners are doing what they can to make themselves um, resilient as well. So that's sort of the 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 purpose of this of this webinar here and we've got a great lineup of speakers i'm pleased to to introduce uh starting with uh my colleague uh K K caitlin rochon who works at uh, durham region uh as a um uh emergency ma ma management coordinator um i'm you know happy to have known caitlin from her time working at the toronto region Co conservation authority where she was really kind of thrust into the world of uh, flood risk management um, with some of the record set setting floods that happened in Toronto back in uh, 2013. So we're very lucky to have Caitlin here at, uh, at Durham Region um, working in, in uh, helping to make us more uh, uh, prepared for any manner of uh, emergencies. After Caitlin, we're going to hear from Perry Sisson, who uh, is a water resource engineer. He's worked for more than 30 years in both the public and private sector. He's currently the Director of Engineering and Field Operations at uh, Central Lake Ontario C C Conservation Authority, or CLOCA, um, and um, really works across the gamut of flood ma management services. Um, after Perry, we're, well, sorry, P Perry's going to speak, speak about the various roles and responsibilities of different actors, uh, including municipal government and uh, conservation authorities. Um, uh, following Perry, we'll hear from Cheryl Evans, who's the Director of Home Flood Protection for the Impact Center on Climate Adaptation, which is based at the uh, University of Waterloo. Uh, Cheryl's worked for over 20 years in uh, sort of action-focused environmental education, and she'll be speaking to us today about really simple and easy actions that homeowners can do to help uh, pr prepare their house for, for, for flood events. And then last but certainly not least, we'll have, we have Gord Weir, um, who is the uh, um, fire chief with the uh, municipality of Clarington, uh, as well as the community emergency ma management coordinator. Uh, he's been with the department since 1982 and became fire chief in uh, 2004. So certainly a really long wealth of experience uh, and a lot of experience from the field around dealing with flood risks when they occur. So I think we've got a range of experience around, you know, how do you prepare before? What do you do during an event? Um, um, as well as sort of how, how the whole system works from a, from a kind of governance perspective. So I think there's a good, good range of speakers here and I'm looking forward to uh, diving into it. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand the mic over to Caitlin uh, for her piece of the pr presentation. Thanks, Ian. Good evening, everyone. I'm going to be speaking to you tonight about some of the things that you can do right now to be more prepared for the next emergency, be it a flood, a tornado, or even the second wave of this pandemic. And these are important steps. 
as we just heard, we know our climate here is changing, so we can't keep doing the same things the way we've always done them. We need to adapt to the new normal and the soon to be new normal. Most people haven't really thought about emergency preparedness before now, before this pandemic, and that's okay. It can feel overwhelming to think about bad things happening, but the reality is that there are a lot of things that we can do right now to improve our outcome. A few small actions can make a huge difference for you and your family, and the good news is that you can do this. A few weeks ago, I found myself at the grocery store walking past empty aisles and products where the quantity you could purchase was restricted, one yogurt per household. It really gets to your head. I spent $8 on a dozen eggs, the last carton on the shelf, because in that moment, I thought I might not ever see eggs again. But largely, my family didn't need to go out for any supplies for several weeks. We had all the things we needed to hunker down. Had this been a blackout or a shorter duration emergency, we would have been just fine. Can you please go to the next slide? Thank you. And this is important because when my family is prepared to be self-sufficient and has the supplies that we need, it does two things. First, it takes the pressure off of first responders and community aid organizations, that they can help the people that are the most vulnerable the people who don't have the privilege of having a stocked pantry, or the people whose home was destroyed or had to leave in a hurry with nothing but the clothes on their backs. And secondly, it puts me in a position where I can be a resource to my community. I know that my family is okay, so I can check on my neighbors. I can pick up supplies for my neighbor who has MS and is rightfully scared of going to the grocery store. Next slide, please. The first step is planning how you'll meet up. I know right now it might seem like you can't escape your kids, but usually we're all busy. Work, school, appointments, we're often separated from our loved ones. How will we reconnect and meet up if there's an emergency and we can't get home? We live in the nuclear capital of Canada. Many of our schools have nuclear emergency evacuation plans. Do you know where your child will be if they get evacuated? More likely is a hazardous, good act, hazardous goods accident. What happens if you are physically separated by an emergency scene that you can't get through, like a chemical fire on one of the, tr the train lines that transect our communities? It's more likely. Next slide, please. There are times that you'll be able to hunker down at home. Blackout, ice storms. We've experienced these types of emergencies. If you have the supplies that you need at home, this will barely be a blip on your radar. It could even be a positive experience for your family. But if you don't have something important, like a prescription you rely on, this can very easily become a stressful situation. Next slide, please. Next is packing a go bag. It's the only emergency kit you need. It doesn't have to be huge. I'm tired of seeing those 100 kit, uh, 100 item kits and the lists that you know you can't scroll to the bottom of. There's just so many items on it. You don't need the kitchen sink. This should just be the supplies that you need if you're stuck on the side of the road on the hottest, or coldest day of the year, plus whatever you need to get to your grandma's, your cousin's, your cottage, wherever that location may be. Some suggest keeping it in your hall closet, but I've heard from many of my colleagues in fire departments that it's really not that helpful when your house burns down and your emergency kit is in the front hall closet. So keep it in your trunk. If you don't have a car, you probably don't need very much. A well-stocked purse is probably just as good. Next slide, please. It's important that you have backups of your critical documents. So many times I've heard of people keeping their documents in the basement. A flood happens and those documents are now coated in fuel, dirt, mold, and sewage. Yes, sewage. So please, not in the basement. And keep a copy somewhere in a secure digital cloud, in a safe at your cottage, or at the bank. Yes, safe deposit boxes still exist. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Oh, there we go. And when an emergency does happen, 
know that there are so many people out there willing to help you. If you need a hand, let your friends know. Go online to your existing social media groups or join a new one, like a Caremongers group. They will be able to help you get what you need. And if you're prepared yourself, you can give back to your community. It's as easy as saying, I'm headed to the grocery store. Does anybody need anything? You can make such a difference to someone. Next slide, please. I love this quote from Mr. Rogers. When I was a boy, I would see scary things in the news. My mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. It is so true. Emergencies don't have to be scary, but by doing a few things to prepare, you can be emergency ready. Next slide, please. We will be launching a totally reimagined emergency preparedness resource booklet in the coming months. So stay tuned for At The Ready. And if you're interested, you can send a message to the email that I've posted here, and I will let you know when the resources are available and how to get them mailed to you for free. So remember, make your meetup plan, gather your stuck at home essentials, pack your go bag and put it in the trunk, make sure you have a backup of your important documents and records, and when an emergency happens, be a helper. That's all for me, thank you. Thanks, Caitlin. That was uh, that was great. Um, really, uh, really good points there. Um, Harry, are you are you ready? Are you there? Yep, I am here. And Kate, All right. um, my viewer seems to be a couple slides behind, so I'm just going to tell you which slide I'm looking at as I go through it, and hopefully everybody will be seeing the right slide when I'm talking. So let me just get them prepared here. So starting at the top, um, good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here and taking the time to listen to us. As uh, Ian mentioned, I'm Perry Sisson. I'm the Director of Engineering at Central Lake Ontario Conservation Authority, or PUCA. And if you go to the first slide, or the second slide, Kate, um, I'm gonna spend about 10 minutes talking to you about the roles of the different agencies and yourselves in flood management. But just before I jump into that, um, you're probably gonna hear this quite a bit tonight, but I wanna, again, kind of emphasize why we're talking about it. So the graph on the right side of the screen shows uh, information from the insurance industry. And they've been saying uh, in recent times that over the last 40 years, they've seen a drastic increase in the number of insurance claims for natural hazard related losses. So those include things like the Fort McMurray, Fort McMurray fire event, but for the most part, these are flooding events. The majority of the natural hazards that they're paying out insurance claims for are flooding events. So over the last 40 years, the trend has been on the rise. And as Ian already mentioned, the Durham Region Climate Adaptation Work and the model that they've created is predicting for us a much warmer, wetter, and wilder climate. So we know that flooding is increasing. It has over the last 40 years. It's here. It's happening and we think it's gonna to continue to get worse. So that's, that's why we're really talking about this tonight. Next slide, roles in flood management. So um, on the left-hand side of the screen, you see all the players, or at least the big players in flood management. And that includes everybody from the federal government all the way down to the individual, the landowner on the ground. And those agencies and those groups, those people, they have to work like the chain. So each one of them is a link in the chain and to be effective, each of the links has gotta be prepared and it's gotta be ready to do its job. So when it comes to flood management on the right hand side of the screen, you see kind of the steps we go through. The first one and foremost one is prevention. So if we can prevent flooding from happening, uh, well, let me rephrase that. We can't prevent flooding from happening, but we can prevent people from being in the way of flooding. So first and foremost, that's, that's our first attempt to uh, mitigate the impacts of flooding. We know that we can't mitigate all flooding, we can't prevent all losses. So as a result of that, we have a plan and that's where all these agencies come together and, and implement the plan and we monitor, communicate, respond, and eventually recover from floods. Next slide. So I'm working through those stages and this, this slide is prevention or mitigation. And um, the little drawing on the right is a figure of a house and it's just showing some of the things that people should be thinking about doing. And I won't get into that because somebody else is going to talk about that later tonight. But everybody from the landowner again up to the federal government plays a role in mitigation. Um, so from the Conservation Authority, 
we do floodplain mapping to try and identify where floods are likely to happen. And we do risk assessments to figure out what the likelihood, what the frequency, what the vulnerability of the people in that, those floodplains might be. And from that, we can make plans. We also have regulations. So when it comes to new development, we're very good. Or I, I feel over the last number of years, uh, all the agencies and the conservation authorities have worked together well to prevent new development from happening in floodplains. We still have uh, historical development we have to deal with. We still have infrastructure like roads that has to cross floodplains. But for the most part, we use regulations and the local and regional municipality use land use planning tools to prevent new development from going into natural hazard areas such as floodplains. The province and the federal government are kind of the big brothers in the picture. So they set the standards for us. They tell us what kind of flood event should we uh, manage to. Uh, they set the guidelines for us. And in some cases, they provide funding, like the federal government did over the last few years with the National Disaster Mitigation Program that, that funded with uh, matching money from the regional municipality of Durham, it funded a number of floodplain mapping and flood uh, damage reduction programs. Next slide. So as I said, uh, if we can't do the prevention and, and mitigation, um, then we get into the whole flood management role. So it starts with monitoring. And on a daily basis, that's something that conservation authorities do. So every day we check the weather forecast for the next uh, period of time ahead of us. We have a network of stream gauges, rain gauges. We measure the snowpack and the condition of the snow. Um, we look for snow melt and ice jam events. Um, we look at radar and forecasts and so forth. The provincial government and Environment Canada, the federal government, assist us with that. So we share a lot of these gauging stations. Um, we either cost share them, we share equipment, we share data. So it's all open and accessible and all agencies work together. Next slide. So um, we do all that monitoring. If we actually see something coming down the, the pipe, we see that the weather is starting to shape up and there's potential for some kind of a flood event to happen, then we have to start communicating. And the little image on the right hand side of the screen shows uh, an image that's actually on our local website today. So you can see the creeks and streams flood status is normal, even though we had a little event over the weekend, everything's fine. Lake Ontario shoreline is high and there is the vulnerability for some communities on the shoreline to be impacted by wave events. So that's why we have a flood watch on for the Lake Ontario shoreline. So we have a full contingency plan. Uh, again, all the municipalities, the province are all part of that plan. And we're all set up so that uh, if we see anything happening, we send out messages, the municipalities and the province receive them. Um, the province also feeds us information back and we're set up to go and respond uh, or at least be prepared to respond to an event if it should happen. Landowners um, can either watch our website or they can go onto our website and sign up for these messages. So if you are in a flood vulnerable location, and, and I guess that's a, a question for people, um, do you know if you're in a floodplain or not? And Kate, I don't know if I missed that, uh, that pop-up. It probably was a, a little opportunity for you to ask the questions to people. Do you know if you're in a floodplain? A lot of people don't know, and that's that's kind of an important step. Um, Perry, if you, Perry yeah. I just lost the poll now. Okay, great. Give people a couple seconds to answer. Yeah, so I should have probably mentioned this one earlier, but late's better than never. Um, so. Uh, one of the questions that we like to ask people is, are you in a floodplain? It's, you know, don't be embarrassed because most people have no idea if they are or if they aren't in a floodplain. And that's more on us than you. Um, so we're trying to do a better job of getting the information out to show where the floodplains are. You can go on to the Conservation Authority websites and you can see a regulation mapping, which is largely based on the floodplain. And we're working to get the floodplain information added to that. So you can zoom into your property and see exactly where the flooding is. Um, so there is some of that information on our website now, and that it'll get better as time moves on. So Perry, the, the results from the poll are 22% say yes, they live in a floodplain, 43% say no, and 35% say I don't know. Yeah, so that that's uh, pretty much average across the province. Um, so if you don't know, it's not a bad idea to visit our website, look at our regulation mapping. If you're not in the regulated area, then you're not in a floodplain. If you're in the regulated area, you can contact us and we can get you the actual floodplain maps to see exactly where the flood line falls in relation to your property. So communicating, um, the messages go out, 
landowners, uh, feel free to sign up for those messages or watch our social media and so forth. Too. The next step, so we've communicated the message, now we're on to the next slide, which is responding. When a flooding event does start to happen, uh, this is when things get really interesting. The Conservation Authority continues just to be an information provider. So we continue just to tell all the people on our contact list what's happening, uh, where are the most vulnerable locations, um, what's the weather forecast telling us as far as the duration of the flood event, is it getting worse, is it getting better, when will it come back down? The people that really have to scramble, or hopefully not scramble, but implement their plan are the landowners. So first and foremost, as a landowner, um, you need to stay safe and look after your family, make sure everybody's uh, properly protected. And if that means leaving your property, then that's the thing you should do. Uh, if you're dealing with more minor flooding, um, you can do things to protect your property. Um, hopefully you are able to um, block the water from running in your, your home if you have um, basement windows or walkouts where the water is starting to get in. Um, another reminder, stay safe, never go in a wet basement, all that kind of stuff, safety first, but where you can try and protect the property. And that'll be talked about uh, later in this present or in the next presentation, I believe too. The local municipality is very busy um, because they're not only dealing with road closures and damaged infrastructure, um, they've got emergencies going on because you've got um, roads that are blocked. A lot of the time it comes with a thunderstorm, so maybe the power's out. A lot of the time you have electrical uh, utilities and water and you get um, not only outages, but some fires, they gotta deal with that. And they're trying to help with the homeowners too. So um, this is where they become very active and it's very difficult to cover all the bases. We've also got, uh, we've got both the local and the regional municipalities that are doing that kind of thing, looking after the roads, looking after emergency services. And if things get really bad and it gets beyond the, the uh, ability of the municipalities to cope, then it can go up to a provincial or even a federal uh, state of emergency and get some help there. So really the next slide, um, again, a piece from our website. Um, that's all I wanted to cover tonight. I promised 10 minutes. Hopefully I think it was about on track for that. Um, if you want to dive into things in more detail though, if you want to learn more about it, understand it a little bit better, um, there are all these uh, information sources. So this is off the Cloca website again. And under Be Prepared, you can see a bunch of tabs there that'll take you to uh, a whole host of information. On the right-hand side of that screen, if we are into a, a flooding condition, um, that's the Cloca contacts. We are available all the time. You can call after hours, leave a message, somebody will get it. We always have people on staff that are working and watching. And as I said before, um, please sign up. Join us, um, get the uh, flood broadcast through email or follow them on our social media. And that's all I have to say. Thanks very much. Thanks, Perry. I think that was 10 minutes on the dot. So well, uh, well planned there. So I think perhaps we can send out a link to the uh, to sign up for the um, the automatic n n notices. I think that that'd be a good a good thing to do to include as part of our follow up. So thank you, Perry. That's great. Uh, next up, we have Cheryl Evans from the Intact Center. He's going to go over um, the top actions. So what what you can do in your in your home to make yourself more pre prepared. So over to you, Cheryl. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. So once again, I'm Cheryl Evans. I'm the Director of Home Flood Protection at the Intact Center on Climate Adaptation. And my little presentation tonight is going to be very action focused and with a focus on what you can do at your home and also putting a call out there that because we are an applied research center, we are always looking for new projects new resources that you need to help your um, help at your home, or if you are a municipal leader, um, so some additional resources that you are looking for to help your residents, please let us know. We're always looking for new projects. We do these for free because it's exciting and we have core funding. So please let us know. As you're going along in this presentation, please let me know if there's anything else that you need. We'd love to build it for you. Okay, without further ado, can you please advance the slide? Okay, so a little bit about the Intact Center. 
Um, we are an applied climate adaptation research center headquartered at the University of Waterloo. So what that means is we are an applied center. We apply uh, research in communities. We're doing community testing all the time. We start with peer reviewed literature that um, primarily other organizations have uh, completed. And then we design community-based experiments and community-based uh, programs, test them, put out practical reports, and create materials that can help um, businesses, governments, and residents to take practical action to reduce their climate risks. Um, so we support local, national, and international research that's focused on climate adaptation. We have two main goals, is to change the national conversation about climate change to address climate adaptation. Much of the conversation has been about carbon, re carbon reduction, um, and that is a very important part of the conversation, but it needs to be complemented by adapting to climate change and practical means to do that and cost-effective means to do that. So that is the main um, goal of our center, is to do the research and implement the supports for helping businesses, residents, and governments to implement these adaptations uh, to reduce risk and be better prepared in the future for all the, the shocks and bumps of, of climate change. Um, something important to note is that we are a research center at the university, so we adhere to strict rules of, um, of that are required by the university. So we operate independent from all funders and we do not benefit from the sales of any products or services. And that's particularly important with the program that I manage because it's important for us to, um, to be a third party, to be a trusted resource by residents so that they feel that they can uh, communicate with us and, and share information in an unfettered way because we are not here to sell insurance. We're not here to um, um, represent any government sources. We are a third party research center. Uh, advance the slide, please. So what uh, Perry was talking about a little bit before was that curving uh, catastrophic loss chart that you saw. So the insurance industry tracks catastrophic insurable losses. That, so those are losses of $25 million or more per event. It puts it on a chart, adds it all up per year, and they've seen these... Um, pretty significant trends upward of losses. So from 1983 to 2008, the average loss that the insurance sector as a whole in Canada could expect was $405 million a year. And then starting in 2009, going up to, it's up to 2019 that we have the totals for, but the average jumped almost more than quadrupled to $1.8 billion a year. Um, primarily due uh, to um, catastrophic losses that can be attributed to, uh, at least in part, uh, to climate change. And over 50% of those costs are attributed to flooding. So these are losses that are reported by the insurance industry, but the insurance industry is a business. And um, they, they're, they're, they pay out a maximum amount depending on a policy. And beyond that, government and homeowners need to pay the rest. So in the re in reality, um, the losses are $1.8 billion per year for in the insurance sector, but three to four times this amount for homeowners and government. And of course, homeowners and businesses are the ones that fund government. So it's it comes down to a very um, significant personal impact for individuals and businesses. Next slide, please. So when you look at that upward trend, it's important to dig down into why are those numbers going up? So the main reasons are related to changing weather patterns, the lower capacity of our land to soak up water, and inadequate protection of from home flooding at, uh, at the home level or result, resulting in higher flooding costs at the home. So in terms of changing weather, like you were um, hearing initially with the, the climate change predictions, um, we're seeing intense 
uh, increasingly intense and frequent uh, thunderstorms, rainstorms, um, uh, patterns of, uh, of spring melt that, that were not uh, com as common in past years. We're seeing um, more of those events and they're, um, they're predicted to increase. Um, and we're seeing an increased number of storm surge events as well. Um, as, as municipalities um, develop land in order to make way for houses and roads and businesses of various different types, um, we're paving over natural areas and changing the ability of the landscape to, uh, to soak up water. So we are, we effectively are losing the ability of uh, this, uh, the city, the developed area to soak up land. And um, we also have an undersized and aging municipal infrastructure that municipalities are budgeting and working very carefully to try to uh, update, but it is very expensive. And um, there, there's a, a longer time frame to be able to update all those and um, it's costly. So they're, they're behind the eight ball there. And when we looked at the whole equation, the only area that's under the direct control of the resident is the last one. And we found some very clear evidence of what the challenges are at the home level. So at, um, in terms of at the home, we've seen some very clear indications of flood protection features that are not adequate at the home and uh, quite a clear, clear lack of maintenance of protected protective devices at the home. So uh, weather is producing more moisture. <clears throat> there's less space for the uh, moisture to get soaked up. Uh, there's less preventative tools at the house to keep the water out or remove it quickly. And what results is uh, rising home flood costs. You have more losses because of these intense storm events or, or quick spring melts. Um, and you're also getting an increased value of homes and the contents of those homes, particularly basements. People love to finish their basements, put all their favorite treasures down there, and water does not uh, do kind things to them when it, uh, when it lands on them. Next slide, please. So could you just put up the slide, the poll question, please? So I'm interested, first of all, to know how many people have actually experienced flooding at your home presently or your past home in any amount from any source. So if you could just indicate that, it'd be really interesting for me to understand that. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, so we've had, um, it's about half people, half the people have already had a flood. We found this before in our outreach work with, um, with members of the public, that the people who are most interested in reducing risk have already had a flood. Um, <clears throat> but I've, oh, I'm always impressed that the amount of people who have never had a flood but are keen to prevent it is is getting pretty close to half as well. So it shows that more and more people are getting on board for um, getting ahead of the game and protecting their, their families and their communities uh, ahead of challenges. So that's really encouraging. Okay, so just quickly, uh, as a research center, we set out to find out what the key flood risks were at homes and what the key opportunities were to reduce those risks. So we did a pilot program um, in Southern Ontario and in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan in 2017, 2018. We completed five, over 500 assessments and a trained flood risk assessor would have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a, a resident, do a problem solving conversation, look at physical features of the house, talk about what the risks were and also ask them about maintenance and then talk about what the realistic opportunities were to reduce those risks. So it's a really important um, cooperative, collaborative conversation. Um, 
So at the end of that, we provided a written report that is completely confidential, identifying the flood risk, the top actions to reduce risk, where further investigation was required, and also um, resource links and follow-up survey links. Next slide, please. The main flood risks we looked at were um, overland flooding. So we focused on flooding resulting from heavy rainfall or these spring melts. Um, we did not focus on um, severe flooding from riverine or coastal flooding. That is something that uh, the in the Ontario um, example, the Conservation Authority would deal with, or in many cases, the provincial government will will help sort of evaluate and, and manage those those issues. They're off. They are um, often controlled beyond the the property boundary. So we looked at risks inside the property boundary and things that were easy for residents to control. So riverine and coastal were outside of the scope of our work. We also looked at storm and sanitary sewer backup. You see a beautiful picture there that hopefully is not too familiar to many of you. Uh, groundwater seepage, so water seeping in slowly. And leaks from plumbing and fixtures, which uh, surprisingly is, the, is by far and away the most common type of household flooding. Next slide, please. So now that you have an idea of the different types of flooding, I just wanted to ask of the people who were flooded, how did the darn water get into your into your homes um, that you know of? Well, that's interesting. It's so different in every community and every um, section of a community. We worked in Clarington and did about 50 home flood risk assessments and looked at the lot level uh, risks. And, and there's, of course, overland flood risk there. Uh, particularly challenging was the, the, the lake level rise and storm surge. So uh, we did what we could uh, within the scope of our research to, to help people out. Um, but certainly it's beyond the scope of our, um, uh, complete, uh, beyond in some ways the scope of our work. So it's interesting that in this community, overland is, is by far the most common. Uh, storm and sanitary groundwater is, um, is similar and then plumbing is, is lowest. So it's just interesting to me to see where, um, where the concerned citizens are, are coming from uh, and the, the key lessons that you want to uh, take away. So that's, that's very helpful to me, thank you. So next slide, please. So after we evaluated all the risks, what we found were that many of the risks were very, very common. But fortunately, most of them were quite um, simple and cost effective to address. So in terms of overland flooding that so many people are, are have had challenges with in the past, uh, downspouts were discharging water too close to the foundation. So you can extend those two meters um, or to the nearest drainage swale. Uh, the grading, so the soil around the house was subsiding in 70, almost 70% of the cases. So drooping toward the house and having water pool uh, and soak into the house. You can correct that to pull the grading back up so the water is directed away. Uh, something that people rarely think about is the sump pump discharge pipe. You're doing, your sump pump's doing all that work to get the water out of your house and then it dumps right at your foundation and cycles back in, burns out your pump. So if you can extend your downspout or your discharge pump, pipe from your pump, two meters, then that really helps reduce your risk of overland flooding. Um, inside the house, the people who did have sump pumps, 84% did not have 
power backup. So what uh, earlier speakers were talking about is that heavy thunderstorms are often accompanied by power outages. Unfortunately, if you've got a sump pump, you don't have a backup power supply, then your sump pump does not work and your basement floods with uh, from water from your sump pump, sump pit. Um, so putting in backup power is very helpful for that. Um, the next two were very interesting. 71% uh, of people had furniture and electronics at risk of water damage and 65% had valuables at risk of water damage. So when the assessors went into the basement often, um, they couldn't see the side walls of the basement. They couldn't see all the floor because there's so much stuff in the basement. Or that stuff was obstructing water flow to the floor drain. So a really simple fix is just to um, put your valuables in boxes, put them on a shelf, uh, move them out of the way of the floor drain, and if you've got furniture and electronics, can you can you raise those up on a uh, on a stand, or can you get furniture that maybe has metal legs uh, instead of wood legs? Um, <clears throat> so those are all physical features that were recorded by the assessors. The next one were maintenance, and those were what people self-reported that they did. So we said, how many people maintain your backwater valve? How many people? Uh, test your sump pump back, backup battery, how many people test your sump pump. We know that people tend to answer in a way that they think will make them look look good and, and responsible, so we, we anticipate these, these numbers might be a little bit uh, inflated, but even given that, 53% of people said they had not once maintained their backwater valve and most people didn't even know that they needed to maintain it. Um, 43% of people had never once maintained their or tested their backup battery, so they didn't even know if it was working. And 40% of people had never once tested their sump pump. So that was where we saw very, very clearly that for the cheapest amount of money, people could just do uh, basic maintenance. Next slide, please. So we boiled down all this research and created a step-by-step -step document that you can use with your home and, and go help your neighbor or your mom to go through these steps. Um, it's organized by priority, so you always start with the simplest thing. Start with maintenance, start with the simple stuff, the basics at the hardware store, and then you complete the more complex upgrades. Once you know the simple, inexpensive things are not not doing the trick. You don't want to waste your money. Um, we have these resources available in English and French. Um, and you can print them out or you can uh, download them electronically. Uh, next slide, please. So the first tip is whatever you've got, take care of it. So um, a lot of people have storm drains or ditch and culvert outside their homes. Just make sure that the debris is removed from those, uh, say minimally in the spring, the fall, so the water can keep moving and stay, get um, collected off your street and get away from your house. Uh, clean out your eaves troughs, um, spring and fall, or even if you have gutter guards, remember to hose them off. My neighbor has gutter guards I can see from the second story of my house, and they're full of uh, baby trees. So they're not going to be they're not going to be um, allowing water to get soaked up and and taken away. So the most expensive and common um, loss at a home is from leaks from plumbing and fixtures. So just test those. Make sure you have little alarms. Um, just check for drips, keep on top of that because that's where you're most likely to have a loss. Uh, test your sump pump and clean out your backwater valve. We have really simple um, videos on our website about how to do these things. It's all very easy. So when I, I hear the emergency managers uh, talking about all these things, I really think about that this is in itself emergency preparedness. This is home safety. So you're developing good home safety habits. So in spring and fall, when you hear from the fire department, they've always got great messaging, test your smoke alarms, test your CO detectors. At the same time, do these things, get in the habit. Um, habits are not supposed to be exciting, they're just supposed to be routine, you don't even really think about it, um, but that's what we want. We want people to develop good habits to keep their homes and their families safe. The next thing is to remember to test these things before you go on vacation. 
And the little caveat here is remember that unless you do your basic maintenance, you often will not qualify for insurance because insurance is meant to cover sudden and accidental escapes of water. If the insurance companies can show that this is based on a lack of maintenance, you may lose all coverage. So this little line here may sound boring. Um, it's not technical, it's not flashy, but it may very well be the most important line. Next up. Next slide, please. So number two is uh, go to the hardware store. They're there to help you. They, they're very knowledgeable. Um, these are simple low cost fixes to help you keep water out. So the overland flow um, to keep, remove it as quickly as possible if it gets in. So if it's sump, sump pump failure or uh, sewage backup, you need it out as soon as possible. And you have to imagine if you have a home, if water is going to come in, what is going to get damaged? How can you protect it? So you can do simple things like install window well covers, extend your downspout and sump pump discharge pipes, store valuables and hazardous materials in watertight containers, remove obstructions to your basement floor, and install and maintain uh, flood alarms. And you can also sometimes get insurance discounts for that too, so that's great. Next slide, please. So number three is if you have tried these other things first and they're still not working, then start to think about investing in higher levels of flood protection. Work with the experienced and insured contractors, get references, please. Uh, get your required permits, plumbing and grading permits, for example, so that when you go to sell your house, you've actually done upgrades that you have permits for and you won't run into trouble. These are a bit more expensive, but you can be on the lookout because you can get rewarded with municipal subsidies where it's available and flood insurance discounts. All insurance coverages are adapting and changing. All the companies are competing, so shop around. And often they'll, they will change their business based on your requests. Next slide, please. So there is uh, the three steps document I was talking about. We now have an English and French version of a self-assessment checkup. You can go into our um, website, it's secure. Uh, we don't need any personal identifying information. You just answer a simple series of yes or no questions about actions you've taken outside and inside your home. And you'll get um, a custom report about actions you can do to reduce your risk and then resources to help you take action. Next slide, please. And something I just want to mention that you can look at on our website is um, a resource that we made with the full support of the insurance industry. Uh, when we realized that residents really didn't understand even what the purpose of insurance was and the different types of flood insurance coverages. For example, most people just think that if you have insurance, you'll get covered for anything that happens, any type of water damage. But typically, like I said, if you don't do your maintenance, you get no insurance coverage. And if you can prove that it's sudden accidental, uh, most people, as part of their insurance policy, will have coverages for number one, plumbing and fixtures. It's part of their whole home package. The other coverages, sewer backup, overland water, groundwater, and water and sewer lines, they are all additional coverages you have to purchase from your insurance company. Um, and not all insurance companies avail uh, offer these coverages to everyone. Uh, little, little poll, please. Go ahead. So the question is, do you have a good understanding of what kind of water damage you're covered for through your home insurance policy? This is our last little poll question. Okay, well that's impressive. It looks like um, looks like about half the people. I'm just trying to. Okay, about half the people feel confident that they know what they're covered for. Um, third, do not, and the other third are unsure. So it's interesting because the Insurance Bureau of Canada in um, 2018 did a survey of 1,200 Canadians, and a full two thirds of Canadians really 
had no idea if they were covered or not. So it looks like this audience is more informed than the average audience, which is great. And it just, I just want to let you know that our center, um, we worked really hard to try to work with residents to help them understand uh, in basic terms what insurance is for and what type of insurance might be good for them. So please feel um, comfortable going to our resources, uh, finding out some good questions to ask your insurance provider. And if you're unsure about what your coverages are, or what may, might be good for you to have, we really encourage you to have a, a conversation with your broker. And remember to shop around. All the companies offer something different and it's up to you to search for the best deal. So I just wanted to let you know about the free resources that are available on our, our webpage. It's homefloodprotect.ca. We've got lots of really practical fact sheets, checklists, handouts, how-to videos that tell you, like this lady here, how to clean out your backwater valve. Um, we've got resource uh, requests as time goes on. We're, we are now assembling um, with a, um, a national organization a list of temporary flood barriers that will be a um, uh, great resource for people that are dealing with uh, riverine or, or coastal flooding. Uh, we also have a resource list of water resistant building materials if you're thinking of finishing your basement or your cottage or um, if you've had a, a catastrophic loss you want to build back better. Those are great materials to use. And we've also dealt with lots of rural folks, so they want to know well and septic systems before, during, and after a flood, what are best practices. So that's now available. Um, and also to encourage you to please get in touch with me or anyone else at our center to let you know which new resources could help you or your community, because it's our job to um, continue to do better and continue to help you uh, protect your home and protect your community. Go ahead. And that is me. If you want to reach out, I would love to hear from you. Uh, put me to work. I like a good project. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. That was great. Lots of tri uh, tips, um, many of which I, I jotted down uh, for my own house. <laughs> so um, thank you. Thank you so much. There's always, always more, more to learn on that topic. So. Uh, we will definitely include some of those resources in the uh, in the follow-up email that we sent to everybody uh, who uh, registered, um, and I'm sure you'll get lots of click-throughs on that, Cheryl. So um, I'm going to move on to Gord. Gord, are you are you ready to uh, to start? Sure. Uh, yeah, I'm ready. Uh, just just before we uh, shoot ahead, there, I just wanted to comment a couple of things that uh, Cheryl had mentioned. Uh, one thing. Um, common that we have seen over the years uh, in basements, a lot of people have their washer uh, in washers in their basements, uh, and they're usually connected by some type of a hose from the tap. Often those hoses get hooked up and then, you know, one washing machine and then you go to the next and they don't replace the hoses. It's interesting, we've seen enough where the, those have failed and they often fail when nobody's home uh, and uh, flood your basement. So one note is maybe uh, I would suggest uh, it was recommended to me every 10 years you you change those the two hoses, the hot and cold supplies, because they, they do tend to dry out and rot. And then on the second uh, note that Cheryl had talked about, we had worked with her a couple of years ago, and we put uh, together some fridge magnets. And when she got talking about it, I went and grabbed one off my fridge. And uh, we customized it a little uh, with their work. Uh, it's got the home flood protect.ca, but it's spring flood protection tips. Just some of those basic check marks, you know, remove debris, test your sump pump, things like that. Um, we use these giveaways. Anybody that wants one, um, you can email me in where we can make them available. I still have uh, quite a few. Uh, we had several thousand of them made up, but they're, they're good, helpful uh, tips. So moving forward, um, we'll talk about kind of, I guess, my or our experience here in Clarington. Uh, I don't profess to be an expert in uh, uh, flooding but uh, certainly in the last four or five years uh, have learned a lot and uh, with the help of uh, you know municipal staff regional staff coloca uh, the residents uh, we've got a number of the residents that are extremely well engaged and do some research and, and have helped us out as well uh, prepare things 
Um, if we go to the, the next slide, please. What I want to show you is um, most of these pictures are down in the Cedar Crest uh, beach area, but not all of them are. But two types of flooding occurred in 217. We, uh, the, as with uh, climate change, uh, one thing we've noticed since 217 or, or maybe even the year before, Lake Ontario, for whatever reason or a multitude of reasons, is a lot higher and seems to be maintaining that higher level, which uh, causes uh, many uh, residents to live along Lake Ontario uh, uh, grief at times uh, from the surge effect or, you know, when the winds are blowing the right way and, and force uh, Lake Ontario up over the beach and flood their properties. Here you can see a little bit of um, where the water's... Uh, some of this was probably lake effect and some of it would have been uh, these people down here have a marsh behind them which collects runoff uh, upland and uh, with the uh, lake being high it made the uh, marsh a little more difficult to drain and it started to flood some of those areas so the, the I guess the slide on the right shows one of the roadways where it had been compromised and uh, one of the lessons there if your road becomes compromised uh, you, you know, it makes it more difficult for you to get in and out a uh, typical benchmark that many people use if you get more than 12 inches of water it's time to uh, vacate and uh, uh, evacuate your property uh, go to the next slide please again just uh, some more slides you can see uh, both probably some lake water and uh, marsh water there which is um, starting to pond around the homes so one of the the uh, Best things to probably think, of, and most of us don't, but you're in, in your home or if you're in a, a flooding prone area, you might want to do a bit of a self-assessment. Look at your low areas. Uh, consider that if you had flooding or you've had flooding in the past, what you might do in the future to try and protect it better. So that slide on the left, you know, um, probably your cheapest solution other than building up the dirt or, or creating some kind of a swale uh, might be uh, to sandbag. Uh, lots of information up there about, uh, you know, putting a sandbag wall all around your home and then any water that might seep in, you uh, would utilize either sump pumps or gas uh, pumps to uh, pump that water out and try and mitigate any water getting into your foundation or into your basement. I will say things we've learned over the last number of years, lots of people say, uh, I've got a pump and, you know, I've, uh, we talked about sump pumps, but well, when's the last time you checked it? Do you have gas for the pump? We had one instance where a gentleman had a pump and then he called us back, he couldn't get it going. It was a brand new pump out of the box and he had never put the oil in the motor. So for that reason, it wouldn't start. So it's best if you're gonna buy this equipment, whether it's a sump pump, whether it's a generator that you know how to operate it, check it, change the oil regularly and make sure you've got gas and then know how you're gonna set it up. Uh, next slide, please. Just that's a, a picture of the, the marsh, which is just north of the Cedar Crest people. And this marsh collects, as I said, most of the, the rainwater uh, down through a couple of streams from the watershed north. So with uh, this climate change, I'll say we, a couple of the pre presenters talked about <coughs> greater intensity of uh, rainstorms. We tend to see, uh, you know, 15, 20, 25, 30 millimeters of rain in a short period of time which then rushes down and then, uh, you know, fills, uh, fills the marsh, which potentially can cause some flooding and, and even up upland where it might come off the fields in a, into a subdivision, um, some catch basins may be flooded or sorry, covered with leaves, debris uh, in the early spring, ice and snow possibly. Uh, so the water has nowhere to go and then it ponds in your, your home. So be cognizant if you're, you're, in those areas that you may have that and what you might do or whether it's just keep your catch basins empty uh, in the spring and fall clear leaves and you know ice and snow um, consider sandbags you can buy them and make them uh, many of the uh, like uh, home depot and uh, tsc sell two bags that are i think they're about six feet long they're about eight inches high uh, buy some of those and store them uh, Another interesting um, thing we learned over the last number of years is usually when you need the sandbags in the spring, um, spring is not the early spring or uh, late winter is and not the best time to be building sandbags because usually your sand's uh, frozen. So it makes it a lot more difficult to build them. 
And if you pre-build too many uh, sandbags, if they're frozen, they're very hard to use. They don't, they don't work the same as uh, you know with a, a dry sand. Next slide, please. Um, this was just uh, the, uh, the last, sorry, actually it was last, last spring. This was uh, another area, uh, it was a more riverine flooding that was uh, down Highway 2 in the Lambs Road, but very quickly we had heavy rains and with the melt uh, flooded this property and he called us, he was alerted, uh, concerned that if it rose anymore, it might start to impact his house. You could see he had a bit of a, an ice shrink there and uh, some garages that got impacted, but luckily no damage to the homes, but certainly concerning. And this, this happened within hours uh, of the storm. Next slide. <clears throat> Again, same storm, another uh, river uh, to the north up, up, I think it was Middle Road. Uh, the resident phone, as you can see, where they, they had a chair there and they, where they used to watch the, the creek while it had crested and it was getting very close to their home and foundation. And they were, we had actually uh, provided them some sandbags to uh, protect one corner of uh, the home just uh, from any uh, further damage from the water. Next slide. Uh, Often with these heavy rain uh, storms uh, in spring with the melt, uh, this is uh, the Bonneville Creek baseline. Uh, this typically happens every year, a couple, once or twice. But you can see uh, the river uh, crested, probably blocked by some ice, uh, and then uh, started to overflow the road. And we had to uh, close the road, it was remained closed for about 24 hours uh, before the rain and the flood uh, water subsided. But certainly areas that um, uh, you have to be aware of. And if, if it's a common uh, threat each year, uh, consider what other options you may be able to do to protect it uh, from uh, happening. Next slide. Uh, there's a few things here. I won't get uh, into too many details. If I believe these uh, presentations will be available after, but if you hit these links, for example, if you're going to consider uh, the sandbag around your home or around a garage or around your well, uh, there's a couple of different tools or apps. The sandbag calculator is a good one. Click on it, you give it the measurements, and it'll tell you the approximate number of sandbags because often people will say, well, I need some sandbags. Well, how many? Well, I don't know. How high do you want the wall? Is it one feet, two feet, three feet? Um, it's a good tool to uh, help you figure that out. Uh, flooding preparedness guide. Uh, many of the websites, both uh, Clarington, our website, the regions, I'm sure Cloca, um, I'm sure uh, Cheryl with uh, flood pre uh, her uh, agency has got some uh, information as well as uh, the province. Um, look at those and they'll give you lots of tips on uh, prepare, uh, being prepared, not only just for flooding, but for storms and other things. Um, we also have a guide at the bottom. It's online now, emergency preparedness guide, which gives you a variety of tips. Uh, Caitlin talked about the nuclear uh, safety, things like that. Um, what things do you need if you have to flee quickly? Often, whether it's with, you know because of a fire or a flood, um, do you know what you need to take? Do you have things? Uh, you know your meds, uh, your phone. Lots. Of, we hear lots of people they grab their phone but forget their cord, so they can't charge the phone. Uh, lots of little things like that that you could create a little checklist uh, to help you uh, prepare in, in the event that you have to flee quickly. Next slide, please. Just uh, some other pictures. You can see how we've used sandbags uh, off there uh, in behind the, uh, the sand pile there in those boxes uh, to help protect properties. Uh, one thing we did learn early on with the sandbags, we just did sandbags then after we started uh, covering with uh, poly. Poly just seemed to help protect the water from migrating through and also protect the uh, sandbags. Sandbags, uh, the UV is uh, very short life. They don't last much more than a year and then they start to deteriorate. Um, you can see those little orange boxes. We got that idea off the Ministry of Natural Resource Resources and Forestry and we built some of our own. They're self uh, sandbag boxes. You, you put a bag underneath, throw a few shovels and fill the bag. Works quite well, but it's a little bit labor intensive, but uh, Things like that if you're in that area and you're so inclined that you might have to build uh, sandbags. Next slide, please. A couple of different products and you can Google or you can go online and or if you, you want some more information, contact me and I can uh, certainly supply you. There's a variety of different uh, 
solutions out there or products. The uh, problem is most of them are fairly uh, expensive. Uh, the yellow bag here system is somewhat uh, it's reasonably expensive, but it's reusable. You fill the bag, so you've got like a tube of water that holds the water back. When the flood subsides, you drain these bags, you uh, roll them up, store them uh, until the next time you need them. These orange walls, the same thing, they click together. Um, they, they're not a be all end all. They've got a, uh, certainly they, they are good in certain situations and they're not so good in others, but uh, there, there's tubes you can buy, um, a multitude of different uh, things. But as I say, most of them are somewhat expensive. Uh, best to do your homework and then figure out how many feet you need and then uh, purchase them and make sure you understand how to put them together. And the big thing with all these, you really want to be prepared. You want to, if the storm's coming, it's the spring, you know, you're going to possibly get some flooding. You might want to try and get them out, you know, a few weeks ahead of time and not uh, the day of the event of the storm or the, or the flood. Uh, it's usually quite chaotic to try and get things set up uh, at that point. Next slide. That's it. Just a, a couple of things too, just to, to comment. I, I can't say enough about uh, walk your property, try and do a pre-plan, kind of figure out what you need. If you don't, if you're not sure, you know, you could check with your local fire department, you can check with uh, uh, region staff, uh, operation staff. They can probably help you out and give you some hints as to what you might uh, consider. The Cedar Crest Beach area, some of the things we, uh, we found were other than uh, the houses being compromised, we had wells and we had septics, all those types of things that might cause you grief during a flood. Um, and should that happen, what you need to do, you have to have your water tested. Um, you know, somebody mentioned sewage, watch that you don't have any uh, sewage contamination floating around, all those types of things. Uh, if you're getting water in your basements, once you get over, uh, you know, probably the 12 inch mark, 14 inch, you're probably going to see some of your electrical receptacles are starting to be impacted. So you've got uh, electrical hazards, things like that. Um, and like I say, have that list, make sure, and whatever equipment you have that you've purchased, make sure you know how to use it and uh, it works every year, test it, put it away, have spare gas. And like I said, any other questions, you can email me or check out our website. There's lots of tips there that can help you. And uh, that's about it. Thanks. Thank you, Gord. That was great. Uh, and we see we've got all the, the contacts here. That's, that's great. So thank you. I just want to say thank you to, to Gord, to Cheryl, Perry, and Caitlin for sharing your, your expertise and knowledge on this file. I, I, I trust that... Uh, all the participants have found it useful. Uh, there, there's been some questions coming in through the uh, through the question box that I can um, kind of field now. We're a little bit short on time, which is I think is okay given the again given the the great content that was shared. So um, I'm going to start. I'm just looking through the questions here. Um, I've got a question: uh, in, Insurance companies. So maybe I'm thinking this is directed to Cheryl. Uh, insurance companies won't cover flooding if your property is on a body of water. Are there changes being proposed to the insurance industry to allow insurance coverage in in that instance? Is this something you're 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 able to speak to, Cheryl? As far as I understand, the Insurance Bureau of Canada is working to. Um, to work it's working with the federal government in particular to come up with a national flood protection strategy a national flood insurance strategy um, so that high-risk properties will have coverage um, they're not yeah. sure if it will be through the federal government through um, um, like a fund uh, that is uh, offered through the federal government to high-risk properties um, or if it will be uh, offered through the private insurers um, but that is evolving and um, it's a really important topic because uh, people in these properties need to know that their investment is protected they have um, there's a reason to repair uh, a place or there is um, a clear line in the sand that tells them it's need, it's time to accept, for example, a government buyout and move somewhere else. So 
All of those changes are uh, under discussion. They're very, very important. And I would say within the next couple of years, there'll be some, some clarity and some good direction from the federal government and the, uh, the insurance industry on that. Okay, great. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, is there anything that homeowners can do to enhance their coverage? Like, are there special products or, or, you know, yeah, are, is there, should homeowners be calling their insurance brokers to clarify what it, what coverage they have and inquire about optional additional coverage? So that's a great, great idea. Great question. And that's one of the, the hopes that, um, my presentation today will get people sort of wondering do you do i understand my insurance coverages is is there anything that i can do um to say get a discount or to raise my cap rate or uh to to get insurance coverages that that match my needs so uh if you go to our website homefloodprotect.ca there's a whole research uh resource page and there is a list of questions that you can ask for your insurance provider to help you um, work with them to to understand if the ad the coverages you have are adequate and make sure that you really understand what you're covered for and and how to sort of really push if you don't understand something um, and there's also a list of very common or increasingly common discounts that insurance companies will offer now. So for example, if you have um, uh, a water heater that is brand new, or if it's a low volume water heater, one of these uh, on water on demand water heaters that only holds a few liters of water, they will give you a discount. Uh, if you have a backwater mm. valve and um, it was properly installed by a plumber with a permit, you will get a discount. Um, if you have a sump pump, uh, backup sump pump, backup battery, you will get a discount. So not all insurance companies offer this, but because it is a highly competitive industry, you can say, well, to your broker, well, does my current company offer that? And what happened to me was I said to my broker, uh, I'm now, managing this program, I want to uh, get overland coverage and I want sewer backup coverage. And he said, well, your company now will offer um, sewer backup, but it doesn't offer overland. And he said, all of the companies that I represent do not offer overland. So I can't tell you anything about any company that, that offers overland. So I had to go outside and talk to other places. And then the next year he called me back and said, oh, by the way, there's so much pressure in the industry that your old insurance company is now offering Overland insurance coverage at a great rate. Would you like to mm -hmm. So it's important yeah. for people to realize that they can really influence um, what the insurance companies offer. And okay. definitely it's competitive, get a good deal, shop around and uh, get your discounts. Yeah. Great, great, great points there. Thanks, Cheryl. Uh, next question for Perry. Um, where do, if I'm a homeowner that doesn't know if I'm in a floodplain, how do I find out? Where do I go? Good question. So to start with, you can go to the CLOCA website. And if you go in um, through our flood warning page on our website, um, you'll be able to get into a, a place where you can actually put in your address and it'll tell you if you're in what's called a regulated area or not. So those regulated areas are the lands that are either floodplain or adjacent to a wetland or so forth and that, that's why they're regulated by CLOCA. If you fall outside that regulated area, you're definitely not in a floodplain. If you fall inside that regulated area, the next step at this point would be to contact us and we can provide you the actual detailed floodplain mapping where your property is to see exactly where the flood is in relation to your property. And we can look at flood depths and, and from there we can even talk about um, things that could be done to try and protect your home and, and for, prepare for a, a flood event if it may happen at some point. So start with our website, but by all means contact us if you need more information or if you need help. And would would each of the five conservation authorities in Durham region have a similar like 
set of information or is there is there consistency there do you know yeah like if you're not um, so in cloak if you're in each each authority sorry is each authority is a little bit different depending on on their funding and how much they've been able to map um, and a lot of this is kind of evolving as the technology gets better and things get easier to post um, that's why we're very close to having our flood lines actually out on our website so people can see them too um, so we're all similar. It might be little differences, but um, in the worst case, if you're in any of the conservation authorities in, in Durham region, just contact them and they'll provide the floodplain mapping that's near your property or confirm that you're not in a floodplain if that may be the case. Right. Okay, great. Um, a question for Gord. Um, what is the life expectancy of a sandbag? I think you kind of alluded to it not maybe not very long due to uv exposure but uh no, that, how long would a sandbag last that's correct unfortunately they don't last i believe most around 1400 to 1600 hours of, of direct sunlight uh so that's not really a, generally a season um interestingly enough just a, a quick tidbit two years ago we thought uh we with with what we built, we had some extra and we thought we would stockpile them and then cover them with a tarp, uh, thinking that that would stop the UV or the sunlight. And um, anyways, the, the following year we wanted to use them and they had all, um, for the most part, disintegrated. Uh, we couldn't use them. So uh, yeah, about 1400 hours. So you, if you divide that by, I would say divide it by about 10 hours because there's not 24 hours of sunlight. And that'll give you roughly how many days, but uh, right. If you want to see some close to ones, a year, yeah. If you want to see some old ones, come on down to Cedar Crest, and I can show you old and new. Right. Okay. And um, can I just make sorry. a little? Point? I remember Go speaking ahead. to Gord before, and he was mentioning that it's really important to be careful about what sand you're using. That it's not pickled sand; doesn't have salt in it because you can unwittingly um, uh, introduce salt onto your property and do some damage to, to plants and wells, et cetera. Right, or corrode your cement foundation, perhaps. Um, anyway, so the next question, um, we've just got a couple minutes left here, so I'm gonna try to get through the last couple quickly. Um, if you have a, neither a backwater valve or a sump pump, which I'm, which this questioner is embarrassed to say that she has neither, um, but I'm sure many people have neither, so you shouldn't be embarrassed. Uh, the question is, what should I look in? What should I consider looking into first? Is there is one more? Um, does one offer more uh, protection than the other? I'm I'm not sure who to put that to. Maybe maybe Cheryl. Um. If I've only got a thousand dollars and each costs a thousand dollars, which one do I go first? Honestly, I I would be really happy that I didn't have either. When I was looking at this this house that I've just bought recently, it didn't have a sump pump. So sometimes that can be a clue that there have been water problems in the basement. If it's an older home, they've had to retrofit. So that's probably a good thing. Uh, backwater valves. Um, it's something that you could talk to the municipality about. They're aware of where sewer backups tend to happen more often. Um, but mm. I think what I would do is focus on not spending any money at all at first. Um, first of all, just do s simple things like um, to minimize your overland flood risk, like uh, extending your downspouts, fixing your grading. And if you want to make sure that your sewer is not backing up, like treat it well, so uh, your sewer system. So um, don't put fat oil grease down the, the pipes. Um, and uh just just maintain your home so clean out your eaves troughs and and that should help to um reduce your flood risk for for the most part i say do the simple stuff first if you actually start to have signs that you have serious problems then take the next steps but invest investing in big things like backwater valves sump pumps uh i would say do it if you need to absolutely need to right okay well, good advice. And, you know, I think a lot of us are spending a lot of time at home now. And so maybe are more um, sensitive to the 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 need, the retrofit needs of the home. So, you know, 
um, good opportunity at least to, to do that basic maintenance and, and think about whether whether you need to do a, a, a bigger project to, to make make your house re resilient so we're at nine o'clock and it's late for everybody so I just want to um, um, give people a ch oh wait sorry Caitlin is reminding me, Caitlin Rochon, thank you for reminding me, Durham region, that we do have a loan program for uh, backwater valve or sump pump. So we have an interest-free loan. Um, I'm going to put that on the uh, list of resources that we send out uh, after, the, after the fact. So thanks for that reminder, Caitlin. And um, thank you again to all the, all the presenters, uh, as well as Kate, for putting this on. Uh, and thank you to all the attendees who were, who were able to join. So I hope you uh, got something useful out of it. Uh, again, you'll be receiving some uh, useful resources after the fact, as well as uh, a survey. And please do fill it out uh, so, so we can have some feedback as to how we might improve, uh, improve these, these types of events mo moving forward. So with that, uh, good night, everybody, and uh, stay well.